Good evening. Good evening, oh, cameras. So there, I already got the recorder on, so no uh, profanity or anything you don't want out on YouTube. I guess profanity. Dang, is <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> yep, shucks, shucks is. Ah. Wad, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Dr. Cleveland. And uh, how is today looking in your part of the world? Going to be a warm, sunny day or? Uh, we are having a bit of a storm here. So for the next few days, there will be storm going on here in, in Dhaka. Is it a... Uh... Is it monsoon season on your side of the earth? Uh, sorry? Is there a monsoon season? Uh, yeah, yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's just the starting, so that's why. Right. Okay, so uh, for the three of us here in uh, the U.S., the only part of our country that actually has a monsoon season, remarkably, is Arizona and New Mexico, so it's and you wouldn't know it because they look like deserts. Um, it's a particular no, no. weather pattern that's um, characteristic to the part of the world where Jawad's from. So for several months out of the year, uh, they swim a lot. Um, <laughs> it, it rains a lot. Uh, okay, well, everybody's here. Um, so I will begin shortly. Anna, how did your presentation to Dr. Rainwater and Dr. Coldren go? Well, um, I was I was nervous, but got it done. And um, well, less nervous than you would have been if we didn't <laughs> surprise you. So, uh, but it got it done. Okay, cool. So, three more weeks, and you're out of here, graduated, and have a job. And yes, no. <laughs> well, I'm still doing interviews, so uh, such as tomorrow, I have another one, um, and I'm waiting for my second interview. Uh, sometime this week, they say that they will call me. So. <laughs> okay. Um, get vaccinated as soon as you can, because apparently that's a big deal in in getting us all back to work. Mm, okay. um, the same for the rest of y'all uh, unless, you, unless you don't agree with that then that's your choice but uh, I'm going to share my screen now um, I'm concerned about the rest of y'all getting jobs too but uh, um, um, Anna I know has uh, been tormented with that because of a rather unusual path to get to her master's degree in engineering so um, Let's begin for today. So what I propose today is, um, uh, let me get this up in something you can read. Uh, this is what I wanna work on for the next couple of meetings. And then we will finish the semester. Um, I have material to introduce you to a model called STORM. Uh, that's an acronym and it's a, a, a true, a proper two-dimensional riverine model. And we'll do a couple of tutorial examples from that so that you will have had the experience of having to deal with that. Um, 
actually I've never seen if it will actually run on the uh, Amazon. So uh, I may have to run it on my local computer. It's a time hog and so we'll only have one assignment uh, based on it. And uh, we need a swim assignment. I think we will, we will build upon this case study for a homework assignment in swim. And I'm aware I haven't graded your other ones yet. Um, I'll get to it. It'll have to come up on the guitar pretty quick here because uh, you need something other than uh, report delayed for your class grade. Um, Y'all don't want to have a final exam, right? I'm hearing a lot of no's. Okay, good. We're, we are in mutual agreement on that. Uh, we will get everybody a vowel um, as best we can based on the project reports. I don't think you all really need to worry about it. So let me go uh, with today's um, topic. So I, I'm claiming that this lesson will explore green infrastructure and LID concepts in SWIM that are incorporated into the program by means of an extended case study. So this is obviously for the next time I teach this class, you guys are gonna help me build this case study. Um, let's give you a little background. Um, this is actually taken from a report which I'm gonna to refer to in a second. Um, but Country Club Bayou is located in Southeast Houston. Um, let me see if I can uh, get something I can draw with. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen. So if I go to point of power, I get a drawing tool. Please don't crash poor little computer, blank presentation. Classic presentation skills for all of you. Just get fast at PowerPoint. Okay, you're gonna you're about to watch me draw uh, the Houston Metroplex. This is roughly the 610 loop. Uh, there is no fill to the loop, so we want to no fill it. I-45, scribble, Interstate 45 comes about like that and heads on down and down here is Galveston. So Glenn Campbell sang a song about it, Galveston, oh, okay. And then, um, see that's the loop and then 59, US 59, let's see, 290 goes about like that. And I forget what it does on the uh, east side of Houston. And then US 59 goes about like that. Okay, so there's, there's your basic Houston. And then you take this area right here and you take four and a half to six million people, depending on who's counting, and you stick them right there. And, and there you got, there you got yourself Houston. Where, where we're gonna be examining is a little teeny part, roughly right about there. Um, a little itty bitty part of Houston and it drains out to the ship channel, Buffalo Bayou. We studied the confluence. The confluence problem that we looked at is right about here. And so Buffalo Bayou kind of worked its way out, out this direction where the cursor's moving back and forth. And we're gonna study a little thing um, called a slaughterhouse ditch that drains into Bray's Bayou that makes its way to Buffalo Bayou. So that's to give you an idea of where we are in the world. And that probably was a terrible introduction. Don't ever do that in a presentation to professors, use an actual map um, because they will critique your drawing when you're trying to do this uh, really fast. So uh, there's a portion there, that little blue dot is a place called Country Club Bayou, used to be known as Slaughterhouse Ditch. Uh, that's important to the original study, not to today's case study. It's located in Southeast Houston. The bayou drains from east to west. 
Okay, yeah, I guess it does go from east to west because the everything all twists around in goofy. Um, that's wrong. It drains from west to east. I'm surprised they didn't get all cranky about that. The upper portion of the bayou is con con conveyed in a concrete channel. It was originally built in the early 1900s. The lower portion of the bayou from the Hughes Street Railroad Bridge, uh, that's right about We're going to be uh, getting comfortable with this base base map. The Hughes Street Railroad Bridge is right about there, in that red circle, um, uh, all the way down to Bray's Bayou is is open unlined channel, essentially natural. I'll show you some photographs in a little bit. Pollution in the bayou has been problematic for a lot of years. Now, part of the problem of pollution in the bayou is it used to be called Slaughterhouse Ditch. If you were naming places in a city back in the late 1890s, early 1900s, what would you, what would motivate you to name something Slaughterhouse Ditch? Anyone with an idea, unmute themselves and uh, tell me why you would name something Slaughterhouse Ditch. Uh, I feel like you might have to do something with like slaughtering cattle back in the day. Bingo! There's a big old railroad yard here. Um, so to send all the uh, South Texas steaks to the steakhouses in Oklahoma City, because everything was up, up to date in Oklahoma City, at least in the musicals that I saw as a child. Um, yeah, Slaughterhouse Ditch got that name because there was quite a bit of uh, food processing along that ditch. Uh, there still is actually today, although they don't slaughter moo cows there anymore. There's a lot of uh, a fish and other processing. So when you process things like cattle and goats, pigs, fish, and other things, what do all those have in common? In terms of the major food groups that uh, the, um, Whoever's responsible for our health at the federal level has our food group thing. Uh, meat. Yeah, it begins with the letter P. Protein. So that's a, those are all protein sources. It, it's important for the water quality aspect. When you put protein into water, uh, what do all the little um, buggers in the water try to do that protein? They go, oh boy, that's a feast. I start eating it and if I'm a, um, uh, either a facultative or an obligate an anaerobe and I start eating protein, I'm gonna do something else to uh, help digest it. I need oxygen. And if I'm doing that and I happen to be in a ditch that was formerly open to the atmosphere where oxygen was readily available, but I'm now underground where oxygen's a little harder to come by. What do I do with the oxygen? Well, you didn't know it'd be environmental engineering class, did you? If you're eating up protein and digesting or, or utilizing oxygen to break the various bonds in the protein to make energy, what happens to the oxygen in the water? Decreases. It goes down, it decreases, correct. It's if the water, if you're underground in the sewer system and the only way air can get into the sewer system is through little itty bitty holes the size of each of our thumbs on the top of manhole covers every couple hundred feet, uh, how long do you think it takes to use up all the readily available oxygen in there? The answer, not long at all. And so what happens is uh, from a water quality standpoint, those protein sources, and there's also a location here in this railroad yard where they wash out bulk sweetener containers and wash out bulk sweetener containers. Where's the best place to wash stuff? Same place you blow leaves to, into the storm sewer. So I, anyway, these storm sewers are clobbered from time to time with huge 
protein and sugar loads, which the microorganism in there use that for energy. And in the process, they eat up all the oxygen that's in the water and there's not an easy way to get more oxygen in the water. It drives it dissolve oxygen down. The oxidation reduction potential changes dramatically. The things go anaerobic and it comes out of underground right here and then goes into the open ditch portion. And that wouldn't have, nobody would have been the wiser because this is not the most uh, economically um, advantaged part of Houston. And I think that was as tactful as I could say it. But unfortunately, the uh, TCEQ, the Houston office is located right about here. And even more unfortunately, there is a basketball court in the back of the office where they play basketball at lunchtime. And you have anaerobic water coming out of the uh, storm sewer and it makes their basketball court stink. And so that's what motivated this entire study that we're using as a case study. And I think that's an important story um, because you know the broader um, socio-technological aspect of this whole thing had nothing to do with making the water better for the community, but had everything to do with the uh, in TCEQ inspectors having a basketball court that they could breathe in during lunchtime. Um, and that in a way is kind of funny and probably kind of typical all over the country. So if you're into basketball, uh, hopefully it'll be located near a potential uh, job source. So that all that whole story that I just told you is condensed into this sentence right here. Pollution of the bayou has been problematic for many years. Um, at the time I was involved with this study, that was in uh, the late 1990s. The high nutrient loading somewhere in the covered portion of the bayou contributes to low dissolved oxygen values, a septic odor, and actually in the right times of day, uh, that odor was overwhelming, and a septic black color. So the black color was there is ferric, ferric chloride, which um, only forms when the um, water is, uh, is, in, is in a reduced state. So it's a, it's a reduced species. It doesn't form if there's uh, a lot of uh, oxidizing potential around. And then the odor was hydrogen sulfide from the ferric chloride changing to ferric sulfide or ferrous. I have to go look that up. I, I don't do chemistry routinely, so I don't have that crap committed to memory, but I can read just like anyone else can. Uh, samples collected at the bridge by city of Houston confirm these observations. Um, and at times the, the water at the outfall just upstream of the Houston Street Bridge. So again, at the basketball court, does not meet uh, state water quality standards. And then there's a table on what the uh, standards are that were that are supposed to be met. Um, they're listed here. Uh, the, the sulfide and the pH probably varied quite a bit at that location or somewhat unremarkable. Uh, the fecal coliform was several orders of magnitude larger than this. So um, that was not the yummiest water in the world. Uh, the temperature in the summertime uh, would actually probably stay around this uh, value, um, four or five degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. Um, and in the fall and winter, you have uh, more flexibility. Uh, the issue was uh, dissolved oxygen. At times, when we went out and made samples, um, we got readings of less than a milligram per liter on our fancy whiz bang meter. Um, the other indicator was fish swimming belly up, gulping at the, at the gaseous air, trying to get oxygen into their little gills so they could do their fish things. And if the fish die, you just added another protein source to your already um, damaged water. So that's, that's the background of what motivated all this. Um, a description of the area. This is what it looked like 
Uh, this is a 1915 map. So the Houston Country Club is located here. And on the modern map, or the more modern map, it's right in this area. And the uh, slaughterhouse ditch wanders its way up to Evergreen Cemetery. So they had a skull orchard back in the 20s. That cemetery is right about here nowadays. Well, the cemetery didn't move. The maps changed appearance. So it was still there. So um, they were putting dead people there a long time ago. And then there was this branching or bifurcation of the a ditch here and here where the um, cursor is going. And in, in more modern times, everything, everything to the left of that red circle is underground. So these, these lines are, are, are underground. Uh, the developers of this region did what any reasonably smart civil engineer, reasonably, yeah, smart, smart is identically equal to lazy in this instance. Why should I make a perfectly brand new underground infrastructure when all I have to do is take this perfectly good ditch and put a city on top of it and just span the existing ditch. And so they put, they put culverts and circular pipes, they laid them into the old ditch and then just backfilled it and built a, a city on top of it. Um, no critique of that, that, that was not genius, but it was a uh, obvious um, thing to do. That's what I would do if I was, if I was tasked with designing it. Don't dig if you don't have to. Now what Nico would do is get in the way. Say hi to the people. Hi everybody. Sleeps all day and then waits just for moments like this to come visit us. Uh, so there is the 1920s. And this actually brings up another important, um, in my opinion, important point of doing any kind of modeling, but, but by all means uh, modeling in a, a major metropolitan area. If I had not known of the existence of this 1915 map, um, it would have changed the way we had done the study. But, but having that old map, knowing that there's some points that were historically have been there for, at the time, 70-ish years, uh, was a good thing to know. Because then we did some more history studying and found out when it got covered up. This portion, uh, shown right here, Ignore the storage units and stuff. I was just trying to do some preliminary work before tonight. Uh, that portion was done by the uh, Works Progress Administration in the uh, 30s, 1930s. So there's been a lot of uh, work uh, here. So what you see today on a map is uh, in many places rep represents a lot of history that gets hidden uh, from the map. Um, this next figure is the same one you see here on the right. And the key features of that are the, the violet lines are the sanitary sewers and the green lines are underground storm sewers. The light blue dotted lines uh, are significant for a computer model that was built for this particular project. We can't make any use of that model because it was in Qual 2E. It's an entirely different kind of tool, uh, but we can certainly use the map. Uh, the other uh, comment, uh, this, this was done in the late 1990s. In the late 1990s, uh, ordinary person access to things like ArcGIS, well, ArcGIS didn't exist yet. It was called ArcInfo then, an Arc map. Um, it wasn't that $100 a year kind of thing that you can get now on the internet. Uh, the cheapest was like a $40,000 $40, one year license. So that wasn't gonna happen for some dumb assistant professor working at the University of Houston that got snookered into uh, uh, doing this study. So we had to use old fashioned GIS or 
what would you call that OG? Yeah, OG GIS, uh, where you had a map and you and you and you drew all the um, all the lines. Um, and I did have something called Atlas GIS. That was only six hundred dollar piece of software, but a perpetual license. So Esri later on bought them out, and just like in the um, Simpsons episode where Microsoft bought out Homer's business. Uh, Esri bought out Atlas GIS. They promised to maintain it. They kept the promise for about a year and then they, they didn't discontinue it. They destroyed it. They literally wiped it out. Um, and, and what happened at that point, then you couldn't share files. Um, so at the time I had Atlas GIS, which at least enabled us to take uh, the city of Houston's database at the time, they were transitioning from a Hanson, something that they called the Hanson database to the geographic information management system, which ultimately was an ESRI product. And so again, at the time, uh, standardization that you guys are accustomed to today and will be accustomed to at least through the emerging part of your careers uh, was everything was in transition. Naturally, with big tech having to face down big Congress and other things in the near future, uh, you all might get to experience the lovely transition period again, where everything old is new again and everything you've done a few weeks ago is broken. Fortunately, this database was done using a time-honored uh, method that involves lignocellulose, aka paper, and It'll still be accessible for another hundred years unless it catches fire, but it won't be very manipulatable. Uh, there's not much uh, we can do because for for today's and and uh, our next lesson, um, it would be really nice if I could kill all the violet network because for our, at least our first part of our case study, it's nice to know that there is a sanitary sewer there and that it intersects with the storm sewer in some places. It's quite likely there's cross connections there, which is why we studied both. Um, be nice to make the violet go away, but short of putting it into my drawing package and turning violet into transparent, which might have some impact on other parts of the map, I have no easy way to make it go away. So I'll use the, um, the, the, the wet, software between my ears and when we draw the map we'll just have to keep track of greens and blues. Okay so moving on in the story the current land use uh, circa late 1990s and certainly today is residential, light industrial, and a couple of large manufacturing facilities. Maxwell House, I think the Maxwell House plant is either here or over here. It's been a while since I've been in that part of town. Uh, so they make, uh, they roast coffee among other things and they do some other industrial activities in the back room. Uh, and there is a portion of the uh, ship channel that, or oh, portion of Buffalo Bayou that uh, has shipping traffic. And there is another, there's another large industry there. I forget what they make. And then there's, all along this railroad uh, alignment are what we would call light industry. They're, they are food processors um, that you know, they take leftover moo cow parts and make hot dogs out of it and sell them. Uh, they take fish from the supposedly shipped from uh, the airport and they cut it into pre-cut sushi thing and then deliver it to all the sushi bars in Houston, which in the 90s was a big thing. You could, you could get um, parasites from sushi literally in a hundred different places in a 10 block region. So, you know, you pick which worm you wanted and, and you went there. Um, and there are some, oh, yeah, that's right. There was a, uh, there is a either Coca-Cola or Pepsi bottling plant. It's either here or here. The actual location is irrelevant. The point being, those are the major industries. This has historically been largely a food, a food preparation part of town. Also along this part where the cursor is 
wiggling are um, small metal plating shops. So they chrome plate bumpers for low riders and other things like that. Um, and that, that's of, that would have been of concern if the contamination uh, was, was metals. Um, as far as we could tell in our studies, it wasn't. I'm sure there is chrome plating waste that's discarded into the uh, sanitary sewer. That's normally is illegal unless you have industrial pretreatment permits. Uh, one of the big parts of, of this particular area is um, a lot of the businesses didn't actually have permits for the various discharges. Um, during the course of the two-year study that we're going to just take a small piece of and try to model it using a different tool. Um, a lot of the uh, businesses actually obtained permits. Once the inspectors told them it wasn't that hard and it would be a whole lot cheaper than them writing them a ticket, uh, they went and got uh, permits. Okay, so going on with the story. Current land use, light industry, some manufacturing. Uh, the covered portion is owned by the city of Houston. The open portion is privately owned, except for the portion through Wortham Park. And there's a portion right here, it's maybe two or 300 feet. Um, this is Hughes Street, and it actually comes out right about at that blue dot. I think that that portion is owned by the railroad. Um, I think it's Union Pacific or Southern Pacific Railroad has a, a railroad alignment here. Railroads are smart. They know that, no, we don't own that, especially if you guys are water quality people. Um, so that's been uh, under contention for a while. They won't admit to owning it, uh, which would bring up an interesting legal question. If you don't own it, how are those piers that are holding up your railroad bridge, what are they uh, touching? Um, so they must own it, but they don't own up to it. Slightly different thing. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Um, we can look at, let's go take a look at some photos. We'll do a little bit of tour and then we will, um, this is as much a test of as this, oh cool, the links work. So there's the final report. And let's go look at uh, what this place looks like at least 20 years, 30 years ago. No, 98, 2000, yeah, 20, 20 some odd years ago. Okay, uh, oh, here's the railroad bridge at Hughes Street. That photograph is taken uh, here by this red circle. Um, Hughes Street, you could park right up on here with the uh, university field vehicle. We'd have to pull it off the street, lock it, because uh, this is not the, this is a, part of town where anything left in the back of the vehicle will, will leave it. And if you leave the vehicle out there overnight, you'll be missing parts. It's a good way to get rid of a vehicle if you want to, um, but not a good way to get rid of a university vehicle. Although that was a piece of crap truck that I had access to. And then you'd walk down here, you'd go under, under the, uh, this uh, railroad bridge. You can see the quality workmanship that the railroad has has done. I mean, this looks like the kind of crap I build uh, at, the, at the deer lease. <laughs> you walk under here and then you get back and you end up back in this area. Uh, interesting thing for those of you, for someday you will do field work. When you walk under railroad bridges, uh, take a little bit, a brief moment of time to glance upward because there was a water moccasin that, that that love to sun on this, uh, not this beam up on the front, but the beam in the back. And uh, that was terrifying to look up and see a sufficiently poisonous snake up above your head. Uh, poisonous snakes are scary at any elevation, but when they can fall on you and the first thing they're gonna catch is your neck, I mean, that's direct injection, right? Game over, you wouldn't even have to, you wouldn't even have to worry about getting back to the truck and getting help. Just, you know, let me die here and come get my carcass later. And so then you get down to uh, this area. Uh, there is a 
box culvert here and there's one parallel to it. And so that's what runs up to the west in this, uh, in this map. This is a double box culvert. And here's another view looking kind of down towards the box culvert, another view. And, and the pictures don't do justice of the amount of oil uh, that there is. This facility is the Hughes Tool Facility. So they make drilling tools. And in the uh, late 90s, um, the American oil in industry was emerging again. And so they were manufacturing stuff as fast as they could. Here's a typical appearance uh, during the time when it was too odiferous to play basketball. There would be this black film over much of the material. And even though the, in the picture that looks like oil, it's not, it was a almost a fine particulate uh, film. And when you took it out and exposed it to air long enough, it would change to a rusty color, long enough being quite a few minutes, maybe half an hour it would turn rust. That was the giveaway that it was um, an iron uh, compound, iron uh, ferric sulfate, sulfide, ferric sulfide going to um, uh, ferrous sulfate or ferrous chloride. And I might have my ferrics and ferruses mixed up. Um, once the water speed picked up because there was a choke point, it picked up some air and it would re aerate and most of the uh, black film would disappear and you have this rusty color, which was oddly enough uh, desirable. Now, occasionally it rained there and uh, all sorts of trash would get collected by this uh, railroad bridge that also served as a trash strainer. And the significance of the trash isn't that there's a bunch of trash in a bayou. I mean, that's no big deal. But that somehow had to get through these box culverts, which means it somehow had to get into curb inlets uh, somewhere upstream, unless somebody was pouring it down an open manhole upstream. So that helped establish uh, that this upstream area contributed not only uh, trash, but quite a bit of water uh, to this regime. Here's some more trash. And then here's what it looks like when the water is flowing kind of fast. The black streaks, in this case, are actual sediment that are black. Here's another um, picture. And this has a uh, material called spheratalus, which is a filamentous, um, almost a fungus bacteria uh, symbiote. And it's, it's Generally among uh, sewer people, that's usually an indication that you have uh, raw sewage somehow getting into the water. So seratolus isn't necessarily a good thing, uh, but, it's, but it's a rather um, useful indicator uh, that there's a, a likely a sewage discharge or at least a, a source of really um, rich organic nutrients to be Ceratolus loves to chew on. And here's another, uh, this is probably a better picture of what the box culvert looks like. And we put waders on and wandered up this a little way, but keeping in mind that uh, the water is just emerging back to the atmosphere in this case, and it already was in a reduced state, you don't want to go too far up in there because there's not going to be a whole lot of breathe gas. And our hydrogen sulfide alarm you know, literally uh, went off just a few feet into here. I had a rope tied to me and a, and a colleague, actually a grad student, because um, we didn't have proper uh, setup for a confined entry. And that would, that would satisfy the requirements of confined entry in practice. But we went up as far as we felt safe and shine flashlights and and this, this is endless from a, if I was a 12 year old kid. The other giveaway is that, that, is that there weren't 12 year old kids playing up in the sewer, which is another indicator that the water is not the best in the history of the world. I have some other uh, uh, views. An uh, interesting thing is this culvert is not documented. It's coming in from the, from the north side. 
Um, I think it's, I think it is a, not illicit, but just a storm culvert that never made it onto the database. So you don't, we don't see a green line here representing it, but there was a culvert that connected directly into the bayou. There's just other pictures of the culvert. Sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's milky. Um, milkiness is usually oil or milk, I guess. Uh, a rare clear water day. And then uh, this, this green, greenish uh, antifreeze looking stuff is a tracer dye that uh, I introduced uh, several thousand feet upstream uh, to try to get an idea of, of the mixing in the bayou and what the travel times were. And that actually was a good thing to do that you wouldn't get in a modeling class. Um, when we initially built our Qual2E model, again, not the same kind of models you guys have been exposed to. Um, we made a logical assumption. Yeah, this is just kind of like a rectangular channel. It's 3,000 feet long. Um, we had drift tracer information, so we knew how fast the water was moving at the surface. So it should have taken, you know, a couple hours for the dye to come through. It, it took better part of a day, uh, which was very useful because it gave us some information on how much uh, sediments must have been deposited up inside this thing over many, many years. So if you're doing a real study, um, advocate if you can for a dye tracer study, especially if your hydraulic models don't make any damn sense. And uh, more pretty pictures. And now we're moving to different parts of the uh, bayou. So this is looking upstream from the culvert under Polk Street. That picture is taken right about here. And here's looking down at the culvert. It's a sizable culvert. Here's looking upstream during a milk run after a rainfall. By the way, the uh, culvert is a excellent uh, floater collector. So anything that gets past the railroad bridge, we can get some more floaters. We were fortunate during the several years of doing this that we never encountered uh, floating bodies, which sadly is a thing that can happen doing field work in major metropolitan areas. This is Yates Gully. So this is up here. And um, Actually, that was uh, 901 Hackney is an address. And if you go behind this house, run along a fence line and walk a little bit, you get into Yates Gully. And it's strangely kind of uh, pretty and remote. And uh, you don't actually know that you're in Houston, Texas. Um, this is one of my uh, student assistants. I can't, I think that's probably Macrina. Um, and we, I think we actually just sat down and had lunch that day and enjoyed that. And then one of our other visits, we've got smart and says, you know, we can just visit this one and get the samples last. And in addition to lunch, why don't we get a beer? Because you know, there are beer joints all over the place. And so we did that. So this is another uh, perk of field study. Um, if you find a spot like this uh, that you're going to have to visit repeatedly, Try to arrange your sampling sequence day so that you can end the day there and enjoy uh, a refreshing beverage of your choice. Water worked too. Here's looking downstream in the uh, um, gully and a few other views. And the last uh, picture is Wayside Drive. That's right here. Uh, these pictures are harder to get than you would imagine because Wayside Drive, it has a posted speed limit of 35 miles an hour. It's, 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 a, it's a four lane bridge right there. And this is a rare photo in that there are no vehicles pictured in the photo. Normally it is crowded with trucks and cars and motorcycles and 
crazy people and ordinary people going as fast as they can in the 35 mile an hour zone. And getting off it to get parked and take the pictures is a bit of a challenge. Um, so in this picture, the samples are collected upstream in the photograph. This is where the actual samples are collected. And this is just a couple of pictures of what the bayou looks like at different tides. So that gets you familiar with the area, or at least that's my intent. And so in the actual uh, study that was done, oh, I want to leave that for a, dang it, there we go. In the actual study, uh, just to uh, summarize it, and, and, and I'll give you the link to the report is up here. And it's in this uh, notebook. In the actual study, we monitored water quality, not just at the locations with the pictures, but quite a few points um, up this blue line and up this blue line. And I think actually one up, yeah, there was one up here because uh, that was, I always hurt myself lifting that manhole cover. So we water monitored water quality. We did a dye tracer study to try to understand how the mixing occurs. And we built a computer model using a software called Qual2E, which is a receiving water quality model. Um, so it was, it's designed to do uh, biochemical oxygen demand computations, dissolved oxygen. Uh, it, doesn't have very sophisticated hydraulics capabilities. And at the time, that was the tool that was selected. So I've never actually done this in swim, but it would have been cool at the time to actually put the green network in in swim, combine it with the, with the major uh, flow paths that we knew of, and examine how the system behaved. And it, it would have also given us the ability to examine um, the contributions of different areas in terms of pollutants, except that SWIM does not have a receiving water quality model built into it. Uh, so all SWIM uh, could really, can really do for us is maybe help us with total suspended solids. So we will fabricate a case study using total suspended solids because there is a teensy bit of total suspended solid data in the actual database. So here is the, here's the whole database. Um, there are a lot of uh, different site visits and the uh, remarks column identifies who, who collected the data. So if you see COH, that means city of Houston. If you see nothing, that means my, myself, those, those five names that were on the original report um, did it. Um, some of these uh, values down here that are attributed to us, that was a sample that was delivered to the city of Houston and they, they did the uh, analysis uh, for us. Uh, because we didn't actually, you would think a major university would have the ability to do it, but we didn't have the ability to do it for an affordable dollar value. Whereas they do uh, 200 of these a day, putting a blind sample in with a cryptic uh, sample ID to do the 201st sample was trivial. Uh, they were fine with that. And then they would uh, phone over the uh, value, actually fax over the values a few days later. So the kind of things we measured, pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, uh, and so on. Anyway, this last column, there are some total suspended solids values. So we can build a model with total suspended solids wash off function and, and attempt to uh, try to get numbers somewhat like this. Notice this has a fairly weird unit. It's milligrams per 100 mils. So to get it to milligrams per liter, you'd multiply these by 10. So the TSS, a Hughes Street bridge on 1st of November, 1999, there's not much uh, suspended solids in there. That's five times 10 to the minus third when you multiply by 100 uh, milligrams per liter. That's, that's, that's 
fairly clear water. And the water was uh, clear um, most of the time. Here's a, uh, a, a rare high one that would have been 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. And that's just a couple of percent solids by weight. Um, so there's not much TSS in this area. So we will go ahead and we'll do a case study and, and fabricate some wash off and then teach ourselves how to do some green infrastructure to make it even better. So clearly in this original study that I'm using as the, uh, as the motivating source, uh, the water quality issues had very little to do with the solids. Now all that trash I showed you pictures of, that doesn't get measured by total suspended solids. Ironically, it should, um, but it doesn't fit in a little beaker very good. So um, even though the TSS in the water column is quite small for this region, and it's not a surprise to me, the amount of solids that's carried by that bayou is substantial. Uh, we just have no way of measuring it. So we have some TSS reading that we can play with. It's a pity SWIM doesn't have a receiving water model water quality model in it yet, uh, because then we could deal with all these columns, uh, which we have data. And so over the course of about two years, uh, there are <clears throat> quite a bit of, uh, each, each of these rows is a site visit. And as typical with real data, uh, there are often large blocks of nothingness uh, because that's just the way life is. Uh, sometimes you don't always get everything. I should uh, pay residuals to make Jagger. You can't always get what you want, but if you find some time. <laughs> uh, so there's um, the database. 3,041 um, individual visits to different locations on the bayou. That's unprecedented. A, uh, a, a commercial firm wouldn't do that. That's probably why they snookered some poor lowly assistant professor and one grad student and one, two, and three undergraduates going out three days a week. The undergraduates loved it. This was like real world experience and they got paid really well. Um, the graduate student was uh, on hiatus between jobs and I just needed somebody to help. And then I did a lot of these. And then these ones that had these cryptic numbers, I think those are error codes from a flow meter. I don't quite know, 9M. And those are some kind of error code that somehow made it into that column. Fortunately, the flow measurements uh, were um, somewhat uh, unreliable, so we didn't uh, put too much credence in those. The only ones that are dependable, if you see the word drift tracer, these are probably velocity by drift tracer. Um, a drift tracer was a fancy word for a orange, or if it was Park and Elmaden one, that's under, that's down in a um, sewer pipe. So that was a Cheeto. It was very carefully dropped to the upstream side of the sewer. The sewer um, access shaft was 48 inches in diameter. And so we assumed that, that it was a four foot drift and you would drop it and time it until it left your site. And that, that would be the ones that didn't make it to your mouth. If it made it to the analyst's mouth, we couldn't use that reading. And, and, and you might laugh, but uh, the, the mighty Cheeto, you want the little, the little hard ones, not, not the round puffball ones, because the puffball ones, they don't fall so good in a, uh, they, they catch air on their way down and they don't land where you want them. But the ones that look like little snakes, um, uh, they, in a, in a sewer, they, they fall just fine. There's no wind down there. So you get it, hold it up against the uh, leading edge wall and then you let it drop. You do that five or six times and write it down and then you can get a decent estimate of the surface water velocity. And a, a, a ridiculed but effective 
flow measuring technique when you have access to no, nothing else. And usually the people that ridicule it are unwilling to write the checks it takes to buy the proper instrumentation to do it. But they will pay themselves. Okay, so that was, um, the whole point of that was to establish some background. Now let me get back to a particular point on this that we're gonna need in a little bit. In the report, I'll let you read that on your own. It's, it is um, exhaustive. If I can, if I'm, fine, I'm looking for a particular picture. I'd be mad if I can't find it again. It's the only picture in this report that's going to give us information to let us estimate distances. Because you'll notice those two map excerpts. If you were to critique those, or if I were to critique them, it's my own work, so I guess I can critique them. Uh, the main thing missing from those is any semblance of uh, distance scale. Now, it's, this is University of Houston. This is Interstate 45. These roads are well marked. It, it wouldn't be that hard to go onto Google Earth and find distances. So it's not the end of the world, but that, that, that's just that's bad engineering report. So there's no, uh, no distances on here. Here's the, here's the Qual 2E model uh, layout. So it had 31 um, parts to it and then 20 plus parts up here. And its purpose is to keep track of uh, water quality. And um, I'll, I'll stop by this table in a minute because this is actually relevant for this class. Remember early on in the class, I discussed a simulation log and said you should keep one. So here's an example of the simulation logs that were done on this uh, project. Uh, simulation number one was to verify the install, use the EPA files, and has the data file name. Number two was to disable the dam feature. Modified EPA file, didn't save it. Uh, number three, disable the algae. Modified EPA file, not saved. And when not saved, you really can treat this as being carried forward to the next instance. Um, Country Club Biogeometry, modified the file, rename it. Uh, the output's not saved. Test the element sequence, not saved. Test the line plot, not saved. Submodel geometry, verify the element sequence, not saved. Plot commands, not saved. Point loads, put a load at the, at the events, which is a location in the study area, not saved. And finally, declared it that we got the correct dimensions and everything. Put the river kilometers in actual dimensions, and that got saved as bayou1.dat. So it took at least nine complete runs of the program before we had our first input file that was at all useful. And that's, that's actually pretty good. That's, that's not uncommon. Uh, so should you end up doing uh, modeling in your uh, career, and uh, I, I assume your supervisor will know what it takes, but if they don't try to, um, judiciously pad your time schedule to give yourself the necessary time to do all these before the actual runs that matter. If you don't do that, you'll kind of be doing it on the fly. And I've found uh, over my years of doing that, that uh, you wanna just make a few changes to each file at a time. You don't wanna to try to get the thing to work right out the door. It'd be nice if you could, but that's a uh, losing proposition. Um, you change one thing at a time until you kind of beat a working file. So notice what's happened here. We beat a working file into a working file. And by changing just a few things at a time, we took the original EPA supplied file and made the necessary changes until it was actually representing our Bayou and not their workshop example. Um, again, like all reports, well, maybe not like all reports, in our particular study, we had to use some uh, fairly large um, Manning's roughness coefficients to make our hydraulic model work. And uh, 
we had some that were about 0.06 and this was the so we, we adjusted it until our hydraulic model kind of made sense. And then we had to go back and find a way to defend the number that we picked. And uh, I did find that artificial channels full of debris, roots, weeds, garbage, strained garbage, uh, shopping carts, dead bodies, didn't find any, uh, have, have documented high Manning's end values. And that was a lifesaver finding this table because uh, it would have been hard to um, to explain otherwise. Uh, this is a problem that you guys have already done. Uh, this was uh, demonstrating a spreadsheet a tool that was used to actually build the um, kinematic coefficients. So the uh, e EPA, uh, EPA qual 2 e uses a um, kinematic wave approximation for uh, the hydraulics. And so we need to approximate the kinematic wave. This, this was actually a homework assignment you guys have done uh, that was to demonstrate that we had a uh, tool and use the hydraulic model spreadsheet to get those for each section. And that you've seen before. And I really need, that's the picture I need. Okay, so we're gonna need this picture because the outfall is right here. There's a place called the vents and there's a, a manhole cover in the middle of Evergreen Cemetery. And we have a documentation that Evergreen to the outfall is 2,750 feet as the human being walks even when they go on to the uh, Hughes property and the guard chases them. And the guard, uh, once he knew that, actually the guard never knew we were allowed to be there, but we had uh, one of the um, TC and Q inspectors with him. He had a big shiny badge and that made the guard go away. So again, if you have to go onto private properties that's guarded, find somebody that has a big shiny badge and preferably with a, uh, argumentative attitude and and then you can uh, go do your work because all we had to do was walk this using a handheld gps to get the waypoints so we could get the actual distance so from this dot to the outfall along our best guess of what the uh, double box culvert uh, flows is 2750 feet that's going to be significant in a moment and also on this old map we found this other alignment of uh, which the guard after the shiny badge was waved in his face was able to tell us that that part was done in 1948 and the old channel goes here and there's some other um, information. So let me set this aside and let's go to our model scope of work. So we have, um, this is a work in progress. So I'm not just doing two steps. So I want to develop a hydrology hydraulics model of the drainage area and we'll initially ignore the sanitary network because that's that's going to be a beast in its own right. I think I'll inflict that on future classes. No sanitary for you all. Uh, and then explore the GI LID features to compute uh, reduce computed TSS in the country club bind. So I want to basically use this physical area just as an example. And we will use the uh, the, the build-up wash-off feature of SWIM to generate pollutants, and then we'll use various LIDs to make the pollutants uh, lesser. So first step: copy base map into SWIM. And so on the class server is a uh, CC Bio base map BMP, and I've already loaded that into SWIM. The second is, uh, I, I claim is to determine the distances represented on the map. And so I have this junction 43, which I just pulled out of my, uh, that's where I think the evergreen um, manhole cover is. It's probably a little bit to the right. I connected it to storage unit two, which is gonna be the 
outfall at Hughes Street Bridge. I drew a conduit using a tool called auto length, and it claims that the length of that is 1,616.85 feet. Now, you, I was investigating. In the view, you can, you can attempt to change the dimensions of the map. Um, but to get the distance right from the left edge to the right edge of the map is, should be about 25,000 feet. From the bottom to the top edge should be about 20,000. So I thought you could just change that, turn all the length on, let it recompute, choose OK. And unfortunately, it just messes with the appearance. And that's still 16. Uh, 16.85 feet. So I don't think that is the tool to adjust um, adjust the map. So what I'm doing with auto length is the way I've always I've been showing you all swim. I've known about auto length for a long time, but I hardly ever used it. Uh, it'll calculate in its units the length of connections. So it dawned on me what I can first do is I'll go ahead and use the auto length. And I know that this 1,616 is supposed to be 2,750. I'll get all the lengths, and then I'll find the uh, value to multiply them by in order uh, to rescale the entire map. That may have to be done manually, but that's still easier than trying to look back and forth uh, to maps and measure things and hand enter them. So we're on step two, which is determine distances on the map. And then if I want to represent uh, my storm sewer, I have a couple of choices to make. Uh, one way is it, I could do like I have drawn out here, which is to actually try to represent every uh, bit. And that's within the realm of swim. Uh, we can add a few more bits. And basically, I'm going to the terminal ends of everything, and then I will join them with conduits. And it should be apparent that this could become a disaster really quickly. So I'm just going to approximate a few, especially when you have these ones that are loop connections. And let's see, that storm sewer goes there. This will be one of the few times that I will take advantage of SWIM's ability to, uh, to pull things as uh, curves. I've programmed everything to be a two-foot conduit. So let me just stop here and we'll do some drawing. OK, so this is obviously, maybe not obviously, this is the hard part of uh, doing things. Let me zoom in just a touch. The other hard part is we need to leave a note to ourselves. So take advantage of the uh, note taking uh, feature of it. So I left that note on that on the map. If I unload the map. That note is still there in the way. And uh, that's a way to leave notes to yourself. This is not what it's intended for. This is intended to label stuff. But I found uh, in the Marsha Sharp study and some other ones that it was really handy to leave annoying messages directly on your drawing canvas. Because it's kind of like a note to yourself that I got to fix that. And then I go ahead and just delete it. So let me load in the map one more time. And I don't dare click on that scale map thing because I, I don't know what it does. And what I probably should do is uh, read more about the auto length feature in SWIM to see if there's maybe a way I can rescale it. So I will take a little bit of our collective time and do that because Google is my friend.
how to rescale, zoom, and pan the map. That's looking possibly useful. Stuff gets easier every time you read the user manual. It's kind of scary. Oh, you. All right, let's attempt to search. How do I search for something? Simple search. No. I don't really want to download it. Okay, I give up. Let's see if we can find openswim.org. That, that'll help. Okay, I'm from a local council in Tasmania. Well, you can, what I'd like to do is load a backdrop map so I can overlay it. I had no problems with EPNet simply creating an image. Turn the auto link feature on. Under view map dimensions, pick the correct units. Move a node away and back to its position on the background picture, and a new condo length will be calculated. If you do not move the modes, then the links will stay the same. Okay, we're going to do it my way, which is uh, we're going to go ahead and get the links, and then we will write a script in Python, because we know how, to resize them when it's all built. And I'm not going to get this whole thing built tonight. So I've laid out a few um, nodes already. Uh, what I don't know as of right now is I don't know the elevations in any of these things. I think when we're building a model from scratch, it's worthwhile to get the topology, which is the, the layout first, and then go back and adjust the elevations as needed. Again, let's leave a note to ourselves. And something that uh, is would not be apparent to any of you all watching this uh, lovely uh, phone call. Um, this manhole that's, that's right in this area, it's 27 feet from the ground surface to the bottom of that sewer in that location. So this, this is truly an underground sewer. It's not that, that, that pseudo underground stuff that we did in water systems or in uh, places like Lubbock. Uh, although I'm sure Lubbock has some 27 deep foot, 27 foot deep sewers somewhere. But the one at Marsha Sharp, um, I know that we stuck our head down it and it, it wasn't nearly that deep. I didn't want to fall down. It was deep enough, you didn't want to fall down it. Um, so we'll have to go and adjust these elevations later. And the way I would do the elevations is I'll go to Google Earth or something. And even though this is a topographic map in the background, I've washed out too much of the detail that I can't, I can't possibly find the elevations in this area. I know University of Houston is roughly around elevation 65 feet. So I got a starting point. And I, and I have those photographs of the outfall. So I would likely I'm not going to do anything if this doesn't give me control. Okay. Quit blinking at me, dang it. Yay. So we're going to need real elevations, and I'm going to actually reference things to the outfall. So what I would, would do when we get around to uh, doing real elevations, I find the elevation, the best elevation I can of that pool that's just upstream of the railroad bridge. And then I know that those are 
12 by 14 box culverts. They are, I think they're, I think the height is the uh, four, is the 12 foot. And it's roughly another eight feet above the uh, top of the culvert to the earth. So I've got 24 or 25 feet and I can, I can work with that elevation and then make reasonable estimates of what the invert elevations are. Naturally, all of this stuff is easier if you have data, but I'm showing you how to do it without data because that is, that's how real modelers do stuff. So, uh, sometimes that is the situation you're in and you don't want to, you don't want to give up a job for your company uh, just because the data may not exist. So this is just drawing lines and, and you all can do this uh, yourselves if you wish. I'll, I'll save the file so that you at least have a starting point. Looks like I was going here. Trust my drawing. Looks like I have a cross connection. Go hit the dot. So that would suffice, in my opinion. Well, it looks like there's a line right there, too. These storm sewer systems with loops in it, nobody believes that they actually exist. But here we have, I have a drawing and I took the drawing from the as-built, um, the as-built diagrams in Houston look like. These are what the as-built look like. Um, uh, you, you got them from the basement of this building at the uh, city and they'd let you look at them if you like paid homage to them. They'd make copies for you if you brought them um, the roast beef sandwiches with a lot of uh, horseradish because the guy that worked down there, that's what he liked. And it wasn't so much as a bribe as it was an expedite fee because I asked him, is he gonna bring you anything if you make the copies? And it's, so I got to charge you for the copy, six cents a piece, and it's going to take me some time, and it's my lunch time. I'd really like, and the, the negotiation is done. I have no moral um, upset for that. So there is, and obviously I got a lot more dots. Let me uh, unrender the backdrop. Okay, so. Starting there, keeping in mind that that's 1,600 feet and it's supposed to be 2,700 feet. This one calculated as 594. Um, we could actually compute the uh, offset right away immediately. That's easy enough to do using the mighty gonculator. So 20, what was it, 2750 divided by so if I multiply the lengths in the swim model by, let's call it 1.75, because that's easy to remember. So let me go ahead and leave that note to myself. So here's the uh, trick. You need to rescale lengths by 1.75. Or now that, that was an important point. Does everybody get what I did there? I haven't changed anything in the actual uh, model database. I know from other information that that distance is supposed to be 2,750 feet. And the auto length, because I don't want to manually enter 
I mean, I'm going to have to manually enter every single length, but I'd much rather do it by just taking a number of almost 1.75. You can almost do those in your head for a lot of them. Um, calculate the required ratio. And then when, when my network's all built, I will, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have anything as convenient as pull up all the links and multiply by 1.75. But if I save everything and go look at the input file, hopefully we'll open it with the right Um, right here, I have the conduits. So that this is just an ASCII file. I can conceivably grab that part, put it into a spreadsheet, get to the correct column, and multiply that by 1.75 and put it back on itself, and then drop it back into the input file. And I have corrected for my scale. So we'll get the rest of the stuff as built as best we can. And the, so the roughness, we can, we can change the roughness with, with the group edit feature in the interface. That's easy enough. Um, right now, I have no information about the offsets, so I can't do much with them. I can get the connectivity built. And I've already made them two foot diameter pipes because nobody would put a one foot diameter pipe 27 feet below ground. That would be unsmart or stupid. And uh, uh, so that's that's where I am as of tonight. Any questions? Uh, I'm going to proceed on this over the next uh, um, well, some tomorrow. Um, any questions uh, as of yet? So, so far, this was just show and tell. Um, if, if you all want to do something for homework, uh, feel free to, let me, let, me, let me save the file, actually back to the server. So if I do this, you now should have as much of my copy as you can. Wait, ask me to overwrite. I never chose overwrite. Yeah, it didn't actually take the input because it's a piece of computer. Hmm. Try that again. OK, so now you have the same input file. Uh, if, if you want, you can uh, attempt to complete it. Uh, to uh, whatever level of detail that you want. Um, uh, frankly, all these dots is probably, well, back back then, I, if I had this tool, I probably would have done it to this level because I had the network data. But let's um, finish off this evening with an observation on potentially how stupid that is. If each of those dots uh, is representing a junction of a conduit, we have to have some way to get water into the system, which would mean that we would have to define a watershed area. I'm doing this willy-nilly on purpose. And we'd have to connect that to a node. So I, I am of the opinion probably this level of detail for example, in this particular region, this is too too much detail. It might be wiser from a modeler's perspective to combine all that garbage there and just to a single input and then uh, connect to that point. Does that make sense? So in this dense part area, uh, you don't want that level of detail. We have other areas where there is less dense uh, sanitary sewer, storm sewer network that we could uh, easily 
take bigger chunks and contribute it into the sewer system. So I will stop there. Uh, hopefully I'll stop resizing everything. Okay, get off the resizing. And uh, we'll pick up with this uh, next time and uh, come up with what uh, might be a reasonable initial representation. Actually, I got one more minute of your time, I'd take it. I would probably, group an area like that. And again, because it's a city, we got to be somewhat, I would probably group that area and take all that, all that green network and replace it by a direct connection, probably to this blue dot. And then I would Again, this is going to take some analyst judgment, that thing that's impossible to teach, but you'll pick it up as you move through your uh, work career. And maybe take all that area and put it into that pipe to get it down to here and, and, and so on. So the, you don't want to, we don't want to over discretize the hydrology because we don't have enough information and we're going to have a hard time keeping track of things. We don't want to replace all of the hydrology here with a, with a single watershed and just connect it to this point because that won't help us uh, answer our question either. Uh, so we, we make decisions, um, somewhat artistic decisions, if you will, as the model builders uh, to get the hydrology as discrete as we think it needs to be. And we use the storm sewer system to help uh, guide our decisions. Now, if our particular modeling problem was had something to do with this particular green pipe, then by all means, we would have to model at a different scale. But we're more interested in the total suspended solids uh, I guess getting out of the entire system here at the outfall and how we can make changes. So we want to have enough of a watershed that we can incorporate green infrastructure and LID features, uh, but not so fine that we can't get it built in our lifetime. So that's, that's all I have for tonight. So in my email, I said, um, I was unaware that Monday was a, a holiday and um, I don't want to actually, I actually don't want to cheat you out of uh, a class. Different times in my careers, I may have been quite willing to. Um, so I propose that we either meet on a Thursday or a Saturday. I got feedback that um, don't do Saturday. So I'm fine with that. And I have a report due on Friday of this week. So what I would propose to do is we meet three times next week. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. And uh, so what we'll do on Monday, that'll, I'll, I'll have, I'll probably have this all fleshed out. So if you want to do homework and build your own, by all means do it. But if you're lazy, um, and that's not a critique, lazy is good in modeling. If you're lazy, uh, you might be able to get to work with the uh, initial base condition that I put together um, over the next few days. Um, on Monday, we will we will finish this and then we'll experiment with um, different green infrastructure LID features and they occur at the watershed scale. So we probably what I'm mostly going to play with is I'll see what kind of um, total suspended solids we get off the system. And actually I will put some effort into getting at least one of these upstream areas in a downstream area to have this, the same physical area because I'm curious what the value is of green infrastructure way upstream versus way downstream is in a uh, watershed hydraulic drainage network. And so the whole um, country club bayou is really just a motivating location. It's a location where we have a reasonably complicated drainage network and uh, actually a regionally homogeneous hydrology. Because uh, if uh, you were to if I were to ask you for the curve number of the area represented on that map, um, 
off the, just shooting off the top of your head, what, what would be a reasonable curve number, you think? Remember what a curve number is? I mean, that's, that's all urban area, uh, residential, probably pretty well developed. I mean, you'd have curve numbers in the 80s or something and probably the same everywhere. The only place the curve number could potentially be different would be on this uh, skull orchard, also known as a cemetery. This city park right here and this area here, which is a railroad yard, um, oddly enough, would probably have a lower curve number than the rest of the developed area around it. So the, the hydrology of this is actually pretty homogeneous, I would imagine. And so what's going to matter is the area and how we choose to represent the drainage network to get stuff down to our outfalls. Okay, that's all I have for today. And um, if there's no questions, I will I end the recording shortly and end the call. Um, have a good, uh, sorry for the short week, or maybe not. And uh, I hope uh, everybody has a uh, great weekend and look forward to seeing you Monday. And I will try to have a homework assignment based on this model for you to work on Monday. It'll be easy, don't worry. I just have to have something to assign a grade in case the people looking over my shoulder do. And I wish you a good interview, Anna. And uh, if anyone else has interviews, I wish you guys good luck too. And then just uh, the world is, looks like it's getting better according to the TV news. Um, we've got Republicans and Democrats at each other's throats in Washington, DC, and that's generally a good thing. And there's a billions of dollars of infrastructure, whatever that means, uh, you guys are gonna have jobs in the future. So that's, the, you went through a hard time, maybe you will luck out and you will be during a boom phase for your careers. All right, good night, everyone. Good night, thank good you. Night. Good night, thank you.